the question that we've set for ourselves is, is how do I find my task in the world as an individual? How do we find our task as a community and as a worldwide movement? Um, in brief, what is the world asking of us? Uh, and so what, what I learned only very recently is that the festival of Pentecost, which we, we celebrated on Sunday, the festival of Whitson, um, began as a harvest festival for the wheat harvest in that area. Um, the date of the festival um, called the festival of weeks was calculated as being seven weeks after the first grains were harvested. So seven by seven is 49 and then the extra day you have 50, you have the Pentecost. Um, so Taking that thought, um, while we listen to Richard's talk about the history and future of Camp Hill, we can ask ourselves, you know, what is our harvest as represented by these small wheat grains? And, and you know, if we metaphorically pick up and hold a few of these grains in our hands, we can ask and consider as seed grains, what could their future potential be? And perhaps we could take one or two of these seeds for the future with us into our breakout rooms and use them as points of departure in our continued conversation together. That's just the idea. So now let me introduce our speaker. Um, Richard Steele studied linguistics and then completed a training at the Campbell Seminar for Curative Education in 1975. He lived and worked with his family in a camp community for children and youngsters with special needs in Germany until 2008. And since then, he's been in charge of Karl Koenig's literary estate and founded the Karl Koenig Institute. Richard is a speaker and a poet and is responsible for the new edition of Karl Koenig's written works. He has been involved in establishing a camp life sharing community with elderly people in New York State. He is Managing Director of the Karl Koenig Institute and runs its office, which is near Berlin. Thank you, Richard. So over to you. Thank you, Richard, from the other side of the world. Yes. <laughs> and thank you also for the beginning, Ulrike, because uh, to, to reach out like this, most of us sitting alone in a room, and then we reach out and can have this inner feeling of reaching out to each other. And it's, uh, it's this straight line that is actually a line which goes around the world. So I think that's a, a lovely way to start and to feel myself as part of this circle around the world. And of course, we have a screen in front of us and we can see all sorts of people in different places. And I, I think it is, it's quite special to be able to do this. I, I don't think it will and should replace meeting from people to people, of course, but maybe this is something which is going to uh, occupy us in the future. How, how do we include this possibility to meet? Um, Richard Blake, I don't think I've met for probably about 10 years. It's so nice at least to be able to meet it on this level for a while. And some of you I've not met at all. So yeah, let's begin. I, I don't want to say too much about the history really, but to uh, try and speak out of the history of Campbell. And we have 80 years of history now, so to speak. 80 years since the move into Campbell House in 1940 on the 1st of June. So we're just coming up to 81 years of company movement. That's quite something, quite an achievement for a social movement, for a community. Not so many communities manage 80 years on the earth. So we can be very proud of uh, this achievement. And of course we can feel a great, um, yeah, let's say load also, or um, maybe also duty, maybe some sort of um, question. What do these 80 years ask of me 
now to take what has been into the future. And actually, uh, just recently I, I gave a talk here in the region and, and I had to compare uh, this question of a community going into the future a little bit like when we get up in the morning, you know, and, and everybody has to reawaken this consciousness after the night. And we don't really know so exactly where we've been, but usually we manage, uh, until we get very old, of course, to link on to what we did yesterday. And, you know, it would be a bit strange if we didn't link on to what we did yesterday. It's, it's uh, a necessity of human life that we, we have to accept what we did yesterday and the day before and the year before, to accept our past as what brought us to this point without the past and all its details, we would not be where we are. So every day we have to wake up with this gratitude to a certain extent towards the past, but also with the question, not how do I do the same again, but how do I do better than I've done before? That is, I think, what we probably all try and do as often as we manage to be conscious of it. How do we take with gratitude what has been and carry it in our consciousness and out of conscience then to do better, to try and try again, that we do a bit more of what we actually would like to do and feel we should be doing. So, you know, every single person has this question to live with. And I think we should be aware that also the being of a community will have exactly the same feeling and uh, will want us to take that into our consciousness too. That this community that Camp Hill has this past, but also needs to rediscover itself every day, just like the human being has to rediscover consciousness in waking up in the morning and include what has come through the night and what we actually don't know. We know usually what we've done yesterday and what happened the year before. I could tell you a lot of history of the Campbell movement. I, I love to talk about the history of the Campbell movement, but more important is what comes through the night, what we don't know about the history of the movement. And one of those things we don't really know is why did the campaign movement arise in the first place? What is this impulse of Camp Hill? And to realize we don't exactly know, we can't exactly know, because quite simply, it is an impulse which reaches into the future. And that was quite clear for Karl Koenig that he was reckoning with far future ideas and ideals and not just something of his time. So uh, there's this element, uh, say this element of the night that we have to try and live with and to realize this impulse, impulse is, has, has to do with the will, has to do with the future. And we cannot exactly know what this is. We can study it out of what's happened up to now, what people have said, what people have written about and so on. But it's every day anew to try and find out how does this, whatever it is, link to this day, to today, to our present situation. So um, uh, I think, this is something we, we need to exercise in Campil, not always to go around with the question, you know, uh, we've heard it so often, what is Campil? We don't know what Campil is. And uh, we've had whole conferences and, and uh, talks and so on about the question, what is Campil and what should Campil be? And so on, not, not because we doubt or because we feel abandoned or something, but but because we have to be searchers, we have to be questioners 
out of this being of the night into the day we are now living into or the, the future days we are living into. So as we look back to the past year or one and a half years or so and realize how difficult these times have been, maybe for us personally, for for thousands, for millions of people around the world, we can say for the whole world, this has been a, a very trying time to live through. It's been a, a crisis, a world crisis we've gone through. And everyone knows that we also can't continue in the same way as the world was before this crisis. And that's the wonderful thing about a, a crisis that we hope at least that future will be different to the past. So a crisis is a possibility to change. And I think many, many people across the world are hoping that we will be able to find these changes that are necessary to grasp the needs of the real needs of our time and not just to continue what was lovely beforehand and what was comfortable and what was right and, and uh, good in the past. That's wonderful. Let's celebrate that. 80 years of wonderful work of the Temple Movement, but how we continue will be different. That's a necessity. So one can sort of have the feeling particularly coming out of, hopefully coming out of this world crisis, that Camp Hill, if it wasn't already in the world, it would need to be invented now. Now is the time that Camp Hill is needed in the world. This community impulse is something the world needs deeply, deeply. So if it wasn't there, we would have to invent it. And that makes our task, of course, very difficult because how do you invent something that's already been there for 80 years? That's the big problem, isn't it? How do we reinvent something which we love and which has been there for so long, which has such a rich past and a rich history, but we do need to rebuild it, to reinvent it again and again. And I think this element is in itself, um, let's call it a healing element in the being of our times. That something is born out of the spirit into today's world, which is not, um, let's say, um, not a continuation of the past, but is actually born anew. Just this is already a healing element for world history, that nothing continues the way it was because it was. There's not a necessity to do things as they were, but there is a necessity to find out how things need to be now. How does something get born out of the spirit world into today's physical world. So let me uh, take you back, first of all, to something that Karl Koenig uh, said at the end of his life. Now, um, most of you will know this volume we did pretty much at the beginning, sort of uh, 10 years ago now the child with special needs. And there we tried to link on to a few very basic, very um, broad uh, fields that Karl Koenig found in the work of curative education in the founding of Camp Hill. And there we used also very strongly this essay of 1965. It's basically the last essay that Karl Koenig wrote. So I think also, not so much out of the past, but very much out of looking into the future, he asked, what is curative education? And this essay, I'm sure most of you, or all of you will 
know this essay. Um, it's quite something special. It's called um, The Purpose of Curative Educational Work. And particularly in the second part, Al Koenig really goes to the depths of what the task of curative education, but of course, what the task of Campilla for the world is. Now, I'm, I'm going to read it, these lines, although I think and I hope that most of you will know them already. Nevertheless, I would like to read them in Kai Koenig's words. We only need to define the concept of curative education widely enough to see its true purpose. Its intention is to become a global task to help counteract the threat to the individual person, which has arisen everywhere. Curative educational attitude needs to express itself in any social work, in pastoral care, in the care for the elderly, in the rehabilitation of mentally ill and physically handicapped people, in the guidance of orphans and refugees, of suicidal and desperate individuals, in the International Peace Corps and similar ambitions. This is the only answer we have today in as much as we still want to be human beings. For a society dancing on the brink of disaster. And now he brings these words that I'm, I'm sure have found their way into many brochures and even statutes of uh, campu places and associations, words you probably know even better. But I think it's good to know that uh, where they actually come from, that Palkoni is talking about the basic need for curative education as he understood it for Campil, for social work altogether, for the elderly, for refugees. I mean, just imagine, he was a refugee himself with the rest of the founders of Campil. And the first children were refugee children. And yet he's looking into the future and saying, we will need this attitude of curative education for the social tasks of the future. And there we are today, of course, with so many needs, so many refugees, so much trauma around the world. So there is only one answer. What is this answer if we still want to be human beings? And this answer he gives. It is only support from one person to another, the encounter of a self with another self, the awareness of another individuality without questioning the other's religion, convictions and political background, just the gaze from eye to eye between two personalities. This creates the kind of curative education which can, in a healing way, counteract the threat to the core of humanity. And then comes another sentence that people have liked to leave off sometimes, but I think it's incredibly important. The last sentence is, however, this can only work on the strength of profound heart knowledge. So, I wanted to, to read you these words because I, I find them so incredibly important and, and future bearing. You know, I, I really think this is where we are today, asking, you know, is, is Campil only a movement of places where Campil is on the letter paper? Or is not the Campil movement needs to be much wider today to reach out into all these social questions of today's world? So oh, there we are. On the one hand, this question of the connection from one to the other, the gaze from one eye to the other. And it's wonderful in the English language, you know, that the, the eye and the I are the same word, so to speak. If I speak them, if I write them, they're different. The I being the individuality and the I being where I gaze 
into the individuality of the other. So it's, it's lovely also in the English translation that it's the gaze from eye to eye. It's the connection from one individuality to the other, from one spiritual being to the other. First of all, through the connection of eyes that can form a new basis of healing. And connected to that, the question of how we obtain knowledge through the heart, not just through our heads, but through our heart. So if we look at this, um, I think to link on to what Richard Blake said just now, this is so much a, an image of Whitson, of Pentecost, as it was through the Christian festival, that it's looking to the eye, looking to the flame of the other. Then this is actually the situation of the Whitson, the first Whitson festival, a circle of disciples looking one to the other and each realizing the flame, the individual flame of the other. I think it's always such a a beautiful picture that uh, the only flame we cannot see is the one on one's own head. Otherwise, one can see the flames of the others. That's the, the picture we have from the Middle Ages until today, really, the image of this first Whitson festival. A gathering where we do not look at our own flame, but at the flames of everybody else. So this turning to the flame of the other, we can also say, um, also turning to the needs of the other. It's, it's of course not just looking to what's um, particularly good in the other, but also looking at the difficulties of the other, the way one struggles to be, to incarnate that which is belonging to my actual flame. We all struggle with how to incarnate our real self. And so to realize that of the other, every one of us is in need of this kind of special care. We all need in, in this sense that we, are, we need help to incarnate what we really should be bringing to earth as individuals. Therefore, we need each other. So, this looking to the needs of the other is so important because in actual fact, it is the width, the dimension of what Rudolf Steiner described as a fundamental social law. We'd like to look at it as something economic within Campeau maybe, but it is of course much, much wider and much deeper than just dealing with pocket money or whatever. But it's the question how we learn to turn to the needs, to turn to the specialness of the other person. And because of this, our main responsibility in life is to become what the other needs. That is my responsibility as a human being, to be there for those who need me. And that is basically everybody. That is why I'm here in this time, in this maybe difficult time. Um, I'm, I'm sure everybody in the whole of history has experienced they were in a difficult time, you know? And uh, 100 years ago would have been much easier. In 100 years, it will be much easier, but Everybody has, so to speak, a task in the time he's living, he or she. And that makes it difficult because I have to find this task, which is so, so individual. And on the other hand, cannot be found inside myself, inside my head or wherever. It can only be found in the encounter with the other. Now, I really look at this a little bit with detail because I do think to understand this principle 
this fundamental social law, not just a, an economic law, but a fundamental social law, is so important that it is perhaps the healing impulse of our time. To look to the development of the ego, the individuality, as something which is a social task towards the other and not basically towards myself. And this is healing because it should help us to overcome the main impulse, the main drive of our times, which is, I would like to name it Darwinism. Our society, the world over, lives still out of this impulse of Darwinism. And this is what we need to overcome. This is what needs healing in our times. Something that was created, basically, that, that um, came to this earth in the 19th century, exactly at the time when Kaspar Hauser was on earth. There this, yeah, incredibly strong impulse of Darwinism moved very quickly, one has to say. I mean, it's uh, basically not even 200 years ago. 200 years, Darwinism has conquered society around the world. And so the healing impulse, I believe, is to find how we can overcome this uh, tremendous drive in humanity of our times that the individual needs to um, become the best and the strongest and so on, to be able to exist, to be able to exist because others are weaker. You see how this is the exact opposite. Yeah. The survival of the fittest is exactly the opposite to what I tried to describe as this um, imagination, this image of Pentecost, of fundamental social law, that I can only actually survive if everybody else is weaker than I am. But that is what drives the world today. That's particularly in economics, of course, but it drives society. The deepest motive or motif of the human soul is not the survival of the fittest. The deepest motivation, motif, the biggest um, driving force in the human soul, which we have to uncover in some way, is actually interest from one to the other. This gaze from one eye to the other, interest in the situation of the other his needs, his possibilities, his destiny. And out of true interest, nothing else can evolve. Nothing else is possible if true interest comes around, then it becomes love. Because this interest, this knowledge of the heart can only flow into the will and become love. So there again, I think we could use this word of love as being the healing impulse of humanity of our times. But of course, it's a, such a difficult word, word. It's been used for so many things that um, it's not easy to know what we really mean. And therefore, Rudolf Steiner was very um, careful in using the word love. He didn't use it so very often. He wanted us to try and discover it in a very new way and not to just live with old concepts. And this is the real power which will change the world for the future. And I do think that this is maybe the central question of Campil today and going into the future. Will we create conditions where this true heart interest, heart knowledge, can become love, can overcome 
Darwinism, which is has conquered the world. So the question is, how how do we build community? How do we live community? How do we connect to each other in such a way that each individual can realize his or her own spiritual reality? His or her own flame. How do I realize that if I can't look at it and I can't really think about it either? I can only realize it. That's a question of will. So how do we go about life? How do we build community? How do we encounter anybody with this impulse to help the individual to find their own spiritual reality? And to realize, just to find, but to realize, to implement or to incarnate this spiritual reality. That's what it's about. I, I think it's quite quite obvious that the, um, the hopes of Karl Koenig that Kampil centers, Kampil communities would be islands of culture. This is a, a term he used a number of times cultural islands that doesn't mean to erect a fence or a wall or something so that nobody else can look in exactly the opposite it's cultural islands means really to uh, be such a strong cultural impulse that it will ray out into the world you know um, imagine these um, I, I like the the culture of the easter islands i think that's uh, quite very, very special. These statues on the Easter Islands weren't looking inwards, they were looking outwards, you know, these big stone statues, uh, which are such a, um, a riddle still today. By the way, if I may put an advertisement in here, we've just published a little volume uh, of lectures by Karl Koenig about those who have died. Uh, well, it's actually called Before Birth and Beyond Death. And in these lectures, he turns to the Easter Islands. I, I was really so fascinated, fascinated by this. But it's a, a very special image. They're called the Easter Islands, you know. And around the coast, these huge stone statues stand and look outwards. They've been interpreted in so many ways. But let's just say... Um, it's an interesting image to uh, build a cultural island where we link from back to back, so to speak, and try and ray out into the world around us. So it's the opposite to an island which closes itself off. Right? It's a true image of inclusion. How do we include into today's society? a cultural impulse which is so badly needed. So that is what Kai Koenig, I think, really meant with cultural islands, not to be closed off, but to ray out into the world, even though we're only small, like a little Easter island in the middle of the Pacific, you know? Um, so we can imagine, we, Camp Hill is also very small and very humble, in what it can do. But if we really stand back to back and build this cultural island, we can have faith that this will have an effect for the whole of the world. So this cultural life, of course, was always founded in Campil around the festivals of the year. That was so important for Karl Koenig. He would have loved to have written a play for every day and not just for every festival. Or let's say he would have liked every day to be a festival and therefore every festival to have a play. Uh, so festivals of the year were so incredibly important to him and that we prepare for these festivals. And it's uh, looking back and studying the life of Karl Koenig and the history of Campbell, it's fascinating to see how themes would go through a whole year or longer 
and to pick out, for instance, I, I tried to pick out a Christmas lecture by Karl Koenig. That's very difficult because there isn't really a Christmas lecture by Karl Koenig. There is a series of five or six lectures from Advent to Three Kings, but not really a single lecture. And there you see, he tried that people would live in this process of time to um, realize this quality of time which has been lost in humanity today. We live in a, um, a space, an earthly space, which is almost void of time. We can link to each other, thankfully, through the internet, and it doesn't matter what time of day it is, you know, we can say good morning, but for maybe a third of you it's evening, you know. Uh, so we are quite out of time, you know, we're, we're uh, independent of what time of day it is, to a great extent. Also, the computer, of course, um, makes us independent of time processes altogether. That is the, let me say, the only reason for a computer is that it does things without time. You know, things that would have needed weeks to calculate a few years ago can be found immediately through the computer. That is the point of the media today, that we actually live without time process. Now, for Kai Koenig, it was so important that we refined our connection to time, that humanity is not bound to earthly space, but again becomes a being of time. Simultaneously, we are in space, of course we are, but we need also to be beings of time, to allow processes to take place, not to judge things as they are right now, you know, and that's the way it is for always. That is quite a temptation, but to allow a process, to allow other people to go through development, to allow oneself to go through development. That's a little bit what I started with, waking up in the morning and linking on to yesterday, but at the same time, awakening new and finding something out of the night. That is time. So, living with the festivals and trying to reinvent our connection to time is something which is quite close to this impulse of Camille in our times, in our era, in our earthly situation today, which at the same time links us not to earthly space only, because they're in earthly space, the seasons are losing their qualities anyway, but we're linking to cosmic rhythms. If we celebrate the festivals, we are not only celebrating, yeah, Richard said about the, the, um, the festival of harvest, for instance, that's something that has very much to do with, with the seasons. And that's what the festivals were in those days. They've changed. They are no longer only linked, the seasons of the year in that sense, but they link us back to cosmic rhythms. If we live with the rhythm of the year, the rhythm of the week, of the day, of day and night, then we are beginning again to live with cosmic rhythms and not just earthly ones. Which brings us again to the deepest questions of, of our situation of today, where cosmic rhythms and earthly rhythms have been cleft apart. We no longer, it no longer belongs together. And we have quite a task in front of us for the future gen generations to relink to cosmic rhythms, not necessarily with any hopes that the earthly rhythms will be solved. We probably won't be able to redirect the Gulf Stream stream anymore, or the jet stream, or whatever is happening at the moment with the climate. Maybe we won't be able to turn things around, but 
we will be able to link to cosmic rhythms that were their origins. And I think this is something which also belongs to the innermost task of Campil to look not only to the needs of human beings, but of course, to the needs of the earth. And the earth is in tremendous need in our times, there is no question. And I do think it is time now for the Campil movement to realize that yes, this belongs to our task. There, there is absolutely no point, if I may say so, in trying to help human beings if we do not turn to the needs of the earth. It belongs together because the needs of the earth link the earth again to cosmic rhythms, just as the human being needs again to be linked to his and her cosmic origin. So you see, it is the same question relinking to the spirit world. Now, I don't want to talk too much about this, but I, I would like to remind you that Rudolf Steiner also spoke about the task of Kaspar Hauser in this way. That he said, if Kaspar Hauser had not lived and died the way he did, the bond between the human being and the spiritual world would have been completely severed. I, I do believe that we are very much in this process at the moment. Looking around us at the climate catastrophe, we are only seeing one little um, symptom of being severed from the spiritual world. So it is the, the impulse of Kaspar Hauser at the same time that we refined this connection to the spirit world. And anthroposophy has upheld this possibility to link to the spirit world over all these decades. So this connection to the spirit we have to see as a precondition to be a human being. Without connection to the spirit, we are not a human being. And there you also see the difference between this way of experiencing the world and what Darwinism tells us about the evolution of the human being as the highest animal. The human being is not just a creation like the rest of nature, not at all. And certainly not the highest animal, certainly not the highest, full stop. But the human being is part of this creation himself, part of this creating power and can become part of it. He is part of a continuous creation because we are in the possibility, we are in the situation of being able to be creators. We are in the situation to be able to bring the spirit to earth if we wish, and if we wish to understand it. Now this is maybe a big perspective, but I, I think we, we cannot understand the impulse of Campil without seeing it in that perspective. That, I believe, is the perspective that Karl Koenig saw, that we realize our duty, our responsibility as creators of spirit on earth, therefore spiritual life in the community as a, a little picture, an image of the realization of the spirit on earth, which is necessary for human beings for the future. So this continuous creation is what it's about. And that is, I think, the original impulse that Karl Koenig tried to link onto. 
it is linking on to this. It has, of course, to do with the, the festival of Pentecost, with this um, descending of the dove. So it's Pentecost at the same time, it's the, the baptism where the dove descends. And we can link, therefore, to these words of St. John, which we're going towards now from Pentecost, we move into St. John's time. And there we will hopefully turn to these words of St. John in the St. John's Gospel. In the beginning was the word. And this word still is and can still be a new beginning. Now, I basically, that's all I wanted to say about Campeo because I think it's quite enough. But, <laughs> but um, I would like to point out that this central impulse that Karl Koenig, I think, turned to was why he wanted the Campi logo to look like it does. Now, most of you have seen this volume about the spirit of Camp Hill. And in there, we have done a little chapter about the logo of Camp Hill, just for this reason, because it belongs so much to this original impulse, or not just original impulse, but impulse which is still there. That's this page where you can see the logo in the hall in 1962 and on the other page we've put the logos of various places there Richard Blake there's a logo of a company in Botswana for instance and other places and you can see how this drawing became so central to Kai Koenig that he immediately wanted it not only to be the center of the hall but also the logo of the company movement and I saw that uh, Christiana Menzel is there today. So, uh, Christiana, let me show you a little drawing which your mother made in 1962 for Karl Koenig, because that is what she drew him to transform this architectural form into a logo for the company movement. And most places like Karl Koenig Institute, for instance, have use this logo, many of you, some regions have used sort of new artistic transformations of this, but it is all linking to this central theme of the question, how do we assist that the spirit incarnates? So I'd like to go back to, to what Richard Blake said right at the beginning. Uh, yes, it has to do with this grain of wheat, because this dove, which is trans, which is descending, is also a spirit seed. Or well, Karl Koenig also called it the spirit germ, or Rudolf Steiner called it the spirit germ of the individual, the spirit germ which. Um, actually transforms us into the individual we could become. So this Campi logo is actually at the same time a germ, a grain of wheat, or particularly as a picture, as an image, the germ or the grain of the spirit. And our task, I think, is to try to build these cultural islands, agricultural islands, where such grains can be planted and tended to and grow because the future of the world will depend on enough people looking after this question of the spirit ending into our times. So let me just finish on that note because I think that's about the time we have, and we can certainly spend some time in conversation if you wish. But I, I do like to point to this um, logo, which in a way um, connects us to each other. We look up to this logo as something which um, 
has something to do with the company import, even if we can't really understand it so easily or um, find details about it or so on, but we can live towards this image, which can take us into the 